Yeah, thank you, uh, Bill. And of course, I'm thankful that we could even do this this year under the circumstances. And I want to also want to put out a little shout out to Douglas Kump, who introduced me to Dr. Swami Das's work. Uh, I'm glad he did because I've, I've learned some things. But to front uh, my conclusion about the book, I don't see any biblical passage that is fatal to the thesis. On the other hand, I also don't see, and the author admits this pretty openly, I don't see any explicit data in the text to support the thesis either. So Dr. Swamidas is therefore not making a biblical argument. He is instead offering a hypothesis that presumes, and I would say insists, that general revelation, the information gleaned from the study of our biology, via the tools of science, be allowed to tell one story while scripture be allowed to tell its story. And the two stories follow similar trajectories and ultimately entwine, but they are nonetheless different. They're also both coherent and true on their own terms with respect to the truth claims they describe and put forth. I think we should also up front uh, get the racialist polygenist problem out of the way. Moderns know that the very concept of race being biologically determined and detectable is a flawed modern concept. And Dr. Swamidas is an expert on genetics, so he knows the idea is nonsense. And in chapter four, he specifically debunks the idea on the basis of science. And in that chapter, he explicitly says, we are all linked together in the recent past by genealogical ancestry. The human race is a single family and a common story. Whatever our skin color, country of origin, ethnicity, or culture, we are all one family. We are one blood, one race, the human race. That's page 44. So that's pretty clear. Uh, as far as is there implicit biblical support for this idea? And I would, I would say, well, sort of, but not really. Again, he's not making a biblical argument, but we should go through this. His work, Swami Das's work, works only if it is correct that there were people outside the garden. And Swami Das specifically has people outside the garden and before Adam and Eve, so he's presenting his hypothesis in concert with pre-Adamism. And that idea stretches back to the 5th century BCE, and it was married to the question of whether there were other worlds before this one. Now, in his biography of Isaac La Perere, the 17th century French theologian and lawyer credited with or blamed for vaulting pre-Adamism into the religious intellectual battle over the discovery of people in the wake of European exploration, Richard Popkin points out there is primary source evidence as early as the second century CE for Christians debating pagans about the existence of human civilizations far older than biblical chronology seemed to allow. So how was this argued? We'll hit a couple tra trajectories today, but in my view, and this is where we're going to start, I think the only reasonable trajectory for the idea of people outside Eden emerges from the Genesis 4 story, the Cain and Abel story. In Genesis 4.14, after hearing God's judgment declared, the murderer Cain laments, quote, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me, unquote. Uh, you know, you just face value reading of that. After Cain's, you know, murder of his brother Abel, again, if you're just looking at, at what the text, you know, says, we only really have Cain, because Abel's dead, Adam and Eve. That's the human population at a face value reading. So who in the world is Cain afraid of? You know, who are these other people that might kill him? Now, the verse, verse 14 specifically, could be read as suggesting there are other people outside Cain's particular family who would bear or hear of his awful deed and kill him on sight. That is, when Cain says, today, the Hebrew is hayom, you have expelled me, and then he worries about his fate, there's an immediacy of the threat that is assumed. A few lines later in verses 16 and 17, Cain departs and settles in the land of Nod, east of Eden, where he meets a woman, marries her, and then builds a city. And that, of course, takes us into the famous, where did Cain get his wife question, and follows that query with another. How would Cain build a city all by himself? Now, this assumption of immediacy, this reading has led some to conclude that there must have been humans outside the genealogical line of Adam and Eve. And this reading of Genesis 4 takes advantage of chronological ambiguities. We are given no chronology in the passage. But those ambiguities are also its own encumbrance. The people outside Eden approach to Genesis 4 assumes a tight chronology between Cain's expulsion and the encounter he fears, therefore subverting the argument on the other side 
that other people required by the narrative must come from Adam and Eve. But Hayom, again, the word translated today, can be read with equal conjecture to presume that today is to be contrasted with the verbs shall be a fugitive and will kill Canaan, or Cain, excuse me. In this reading, a long stretch of time between the expulsion and the threat feared by Cain is assumed. With respect to that time period, the statement of Genesis 5-4 is brought to bear that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. And this allows his potentially lethal enemies, his future wife and the necessary co-workers in city building to come in fact from Adam and Eve, their subsequent children. So the question is, should we marry Hayom today with the imperfect future time verb forms or divorce those two features of the text? And that is a matter of hermeneutical preference. As a result, we have a textual uncertainty that creates an interpretive opening for people outside the garden, but that's all it is. It's just an opening. Let's talk about some dead end defenses of the idea. While Genesis 4 at least gives us a possibility to ponder other so-called biblical arguments that seek to bolster the idea of people outside Eden do not. They are internally inconsistent with respect to the early chapters of Genesis or otherwise have no merit. For example, one speculation is that the term Adam might allow for two separate human lineages, one outside the garden, one inside. Technically, when Adam is prefixed with the definite article in Hebrew, ha-Adam, or with a preposition, la-Adam, the form should not be translated as a proper personal name by rule of Hebrew grammar. Translations such as humankind, the man, or this or that man are appropriate when you have the article. When Adam lacks the definite article, the term may be a proper personal name, Adam, or not. Besides a personal name, the term may be translated as indefinite, a man, or still generically humankind. Now, for our purposes, this variability has raised the question of whether the early chapters of Genesis might be reread for two human lines, one deriving from generic or indefinite Adam the other from personal name, Adam. Right? This argument is part of a wider theological consideration. It has long been noted that Adam's story has strong parallels to the story of Israel. The import of the observation is that it allows the postulate, as Israel was an elect subset of humanity, the corporate son of God, according to Exodus 4.23 and Hosea 11.1, so might Adam be an elect subset of a wider humanity. Whatever coherence the Adam-Israel analogy might have, applying that to the question of people outside Eden is unsustainable. The, what I'll call the two Adam strategy for doing so is undermined by Genesis 5, specifically 1 through 3, where we are provided with the genealogy of Adam, no definite article there. This genealogy is not just any man, nor of generic humanity, but Adam. Genesis 5, 1b through 2 takes this form, Adam, without the article. And then it links it to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where humans are created bara in the image of God, or as I would prefer, as the image of God, uh, which is a rendering based on a point of Hebrew grammar and syntax that leads me to take the functional view of the image, that it refers to a status, not any quality or attribute. And that view aligns with Dr. Swaminas's hypothesis. But at any rate, we have a linkage between Genesis 5, 1, and 2 back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. In Genesis 5, 3, we get the lifespan of Adam, again, without the article. So Adam, the point is that in Genesis 5, 1 through 3, we see that the writer uses Adam without the article to refer to both the person Adam and broader humanity that extends from them, from Adam and Eve. So asserting that one textual form points to non-Adamic humans cannot stand. Now, Dr. Swamidas also notes appeals to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the episode of the sons of God, the daughters of men, the Nephilim. Some posit that the sons of God are the godly line of Adam, continued via Seth in Genesis 5, and the daughters of men are some other less godly human lineage, that of Cain and the standard articulation of the idea. The Nephilim produced by the forbidden union are not giants or anything else unusual since, so this view argues, Nephilim comes from Hebrew nafal and means fallen ones as in evil people or those who fall upon as in warriors. 
Now, I say Swamidas notes this perspective because he doesn't base his hypothesis on you know, this idea. And that's a good thing as none of those presumptions stand scrutiny. They have no textual, contextual, or logical merit. The passage rather describes a transgression of supernatural and natural realms, how it produced demigods and or giants and ultimately demons. It is firmly rooted in Mesopotamian antecedent literature and has clear relationships to Second Temple Jewish texts repurposed in the New Testament. The scholarly literature establishing all of those assertions is copious to say the least. What about Romans 5? Let's just go to Romans 5 because this is sort of the fundamental passage. This is the passage that launched La Perere's thinking in regard to pre-Adamites. La Perere could not read Greek or Hebrew for that matter. So this passage in Romans was known to him via Latin and a 1656 English translation that he quotes in his writings, which reads as follows. As by one man sin entered into the world and by sin death, so likewise death had power over all men, because in him all men sinned. For till the time of the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when the law was not. But death reigned from Adam into Moses, even those upon, even upon those who had not sinned according to the similitude of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of the future. Now, the key line for La Perere in this regard was, for till the time of the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when the law was not, when it didn't exist. La Perere interpreted the passage to say that the law came into the world with Adam, by which he meant natural law that preceded the law of Moses. This must be the case, he thought, since there was sin before Adam. How can one call any act sin if there was no law? The language must speak of willful acts against an order by intelligent, willful transgressors. And consequently, La Perere reasoned there was sin before Adam, but it only took on moral significance with Adam. Therefore, there must have been men before Adam. Now, contemporary biblical scholars of all theological persuasions or none will immediately recognize the weaknesses of these arguments in La Perere's interpretation, but that doesn't really matter for us because Dr. Swamidas is not depending on Romans 5. So the question in regard to Romans 5, 12 to 14 should be whether, if Dr. Swamidas's hypothesis is correct, is there a violation of the meaning of Romans 5, 12 through 14? And in that regard, the central point is verse 12. I'm gonna read from ESV now. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Now, the verse seems to disallow people before Adam. It clearly states that Adam's sin brought death into God's world. If there were people before Adam, did they not die? If, if these people could die, how are they really people? You know, could they not sin? If they could sin, it would seem possible to regard, impossible to regard them as God's imagers. In view of the image, being created in God's image has something to do with moral responsibility. I mean, any, any view takes that. And this is especially true, though, for the functional view, which, again, is the one I hold. Now, Romans 5 seems to force the conclusion that humans created in God's image before Adam cannot be biblically feasible. But it, that's a premature conclusion. And I'm gonna, here's my thought experiment. We know from elsewhere in Romans 5 that Paul is talking about Adam. And so he has the fall of Genesis 3 in view, the first sin of humankind. There's no ambiguity on that point. Romans 5.12 statement that just as sin came into the world through one man is about the first sin, which can only refer to what happened in Eden. It thus applies only to Adam, Eve, and their progeny. No one else. The ensuing phrase, and death through sin, has nothing to do with physical death of any animal or person before the fall. It is a comment about the event of Eden and circumstances after the fall. Death now invades the Edenic storyline, which will affect all of Adam and Eve's descendants. The story of Eden made God's wish to have humans in his presence forever, for in Eden there was no death. The original desire of God did not include death. The next phrase follows, so death spread to all men, all humankind. <clears throat> death has entered the picture because of Adam and Eve's sin. The death Paul is speaking of is both spiritual and physical. Spiritually, the humans born from the couple that shared God's sacred space are now estranged from God. Why this must be part of our reading of Eden's fall has long been noted by biblical scholars, because Adam and Eve didn't just drop over dead when they sinned. They were separated from God. And physically, Adam and Eve will now age and die, and their children, and in Swami Das's hypothesis, this subsumes all of humanity from this point forward. Their children are no longer destined for immortality. Death spreads to all humanity. 
The humanity this concerns is the same humanity referenced with respect to the sin, Adam and Eve, and all who will inherit the creation mandate from them. The last part of Romans 5.12 is another concern for many. ESV has because all sin. This has, for the most part, been understood as indicating Adam's guilt now falls to all his descendants, not just death, by the way, which is actually what the verse says. It doesn't say anything about guilt. It only talks about death via either the seminal or headship understanding. But a minority of Christian thinkers take a different position. That Romans 5.12 has nothing to do with the transference of guilt. I hold this view, which is based on two items. One, not overreading the passage to insert guilt into the verse alongside death and two, interpreting the grammar and syntax of preposition epi plus relative pronoun preceding the verb form differently. I read all that differently. And understanding the verb form as nomic or a constative aorist. So the phrase is translated with the result that all sin or that all have sinned. Consequently, the idea traditionally extracted from Romans 5.12 that the guilt of Adam is somehow transferred to all humans thereafter is not an obstacle for me when considering the Swami Das hypothesis. However, it should be noted that this hypothesis isn't dependent on this minority view of Romans 5.12. Why? Because he's not, he's still only talking about humans who descend from Adam and Eve. The question Michael, is why I need to ask you to wrap it up yeah. in the interests of other participants. I'm at, I'm at the end here. The question of why humans are guilty before God, again, isn't even in the picture. And so the last thing I have to say here is, in the end, the Swami Das hypothesis is workable. Romans 5.12 does not need to violate Genesis 1, 2, or 3. And God created Adam and Eve de novo, stepping into his experiment to create a world filled with embodied life forms. And I don't see anything that's fatal to this, but I also don't see biblical support, like I said at the beginning. And I'm positively predisposed to the idea. But again, that's sort of where it's at. You know, nothing specific in support. And I don't think anything specific overturns it either.